Uh, so I wanted to start by thanking the organizers for inviting me and for having this conference. This has been a really wonderful conference so far. Hopefully I won't disappoint. Um, and also just for those who vaguely know what I'm interested in, you can tell that uh, the title of this talk was really just stuff Ina is interested in and might talk about. So I'm going to be talking about uh, constructing derived motivic measures is sort of the more specific title of what I'm going to be doing. Um, so uh, I'm really talking about baby motives. So what, what do I mean about baby motives? Well, varieties are sort of meant to behave as though they have important pieces that classify how they behave. And you can break them up into pieces and reassemble them. And somehow this is meant to work additively. So ideally, in a, in a perfect world, the category of varieties would be an abelian category. And you'd be able to do linear algebra with it. And life would be amazing. And this is sort of growth and dream dream of how motives should work. And unfortunately, we live in the real world where things don't work that way. But I want to tell you a little bit about some nice ways in which things work. So if you want to study how varieties are, can be cut up and reassembled, you can just define an object. And this is called the growth and ring of varieties. Um, and there's some base field. And this is probably the last time I'm going to write it on varieties. And this is the free abelian group generated by varieties over k modulo the relation that whenever you have a closed subvariety y of x, we're going to be we're going to allow ourselves to cut it out. So x is going to equal y plus the complement of y. So this is a perfectly reasonable abelian group. Um, you can put a multiplication on it by just saying it's induced by the Cartesian product of varieties. Today I won't be worrying about that, so I'm not going to write that down. And you can ask, OK, what does this abelian group look like? So for example, we have, uh, suppose that we have two varieties which are piecewise isomorphic in the sense that, so suppose that we have uh, some filtration on one and then we have a filtration on another one. And suppose that we know that x, that the complement, so each strata, that these are isomorphic in some way. Well, the. Do you, do you assume that the base field is algebraically closed? No. Mm -hmm. No. Um, then, so you can do this, and then you can say, OK, well, we can just use this relation a whole bunch of times to see that these are going to be equal in the growth and decreasing. So if two things are sort of piecewise isomorphic, then they're equal in the growth and decreasing. So unfortunately, the reverse doesn't hold. And uh, we know this now. So reverse is not true. And this is due to Borisov. And we have, there's actually a whole bunch of bad things about this ring. Like for instance, it has zero divisors. And for instance, the class of the affine line is a zero divisor. So it, it's a really difficult ring to work with. But we'd still like to be able to, for instance, say that two varieties are not equal in the growth and decreasing. We want to somehow be able to say, OK, well, this growth and decreasing doesn't keep a track of piecewise isomorphism class, but it keeps track of some geometric information. And the way that you can do this is by the usual method of, OK, we can map into things to try to learn about them. We can map out of things to try to learn out about them. And the standard thing to do with growth and decreasing varieties is to map out of it. So these are called motivic measures. And these are simply uh, homomorphisms out of the growth and decreasing, just for some abelian group A. So here are some examples. So the first one is assuming that k is finite. We have point counting. And this lives inside z. So you can just check, OK, any point of a variety is either going to be in the closed subvariety or the complement. So this uh, relation is, is preserved. So this gives you a valid homomorphism. So here's another example. And now I'm going to assume that k is the complex numbers. 
And I'm going to do Euler characteristic. And when I say Euler characteristic, I mean compactly supported, because we might have non-compact varieties. So um, for compactly supported Euler characteristic, uh, you can think of it, for instance, as um, you can write this, for instance, as the alternating sum of the dimension of the cohomology with compact supports. And here I just mean the, um, like the usual topological singular cohomology, say, with compact supports. Um, and this is a perfectly reasonable thing. And if we have a closed subvariety, we have a long exact sequence in compactly supported cohomology. And because we have a long exact sequence, it gives us the Euler characteristic is a valid homomorphism out of this. And last example, when k is finite, um, so we can take the local zeta function. So by this, I mean x of the sum over extensions of k of degree n, of, you know, of all degrees, there's one of each degree, of the number of points in that extension over n times t to the n. And this lives in the big vit ring. So this is 1 plus t z t under multiplication. And it's not obvious that it's the coefficients are going to be integers, but you can actually rewrite this entire power series as summing over the just k points of symmetric powers of your variety. And those are all going to be integers. So this is, in fact, going to land in, the, in power series and the integers. So these are sort of some of the classical definitions of motivic measures. And I just want to point out that we're losing a lot of information when we do this. So for the first one, let's just look at this one first. This is point counting. But looking at the k points of a variety, you don't just get a number. You actually get a finite set of points in your variety. So this top one actually lives in k0 of finite sets, where you can, if you haven't seen k0, you can define k0 like this, where we don't worry about the closed embedding. It's just finite sets under decomposition. And then if you look at this one, well, you can say, OK, here we took the dimension of these q vector spaces, but there was no reason why we needed to take the dimension. We could have taken the entire q vector space. Or moreover, we could have said, hey, this is the, com like, if, uh, x is at least smooth projective, we could have, well, in fact, just in general, we can take in the mixed Hodge structure on this instead. So this lives in k0 of mixed Hodge structures. Or if you're not comfortable with this, it also lives inside k0 of q, where instead of taking just the dimension of the vector space, we just take the entire vector space. And so, um, and then you can look here, and you can say, OK, well, this doesn't look, live in the k0 of anything. This has infinite, an infinite amount of information in it, and a k0 really can't. K, k theory studies finiteness. But a zeta function only has a finite amount of information. That's sort of the point. And uh, you can use the grothendieck lefschetz fixed point theorem to say, oh, well, what's actually happening is that we're taking the L-adic cohomology of x, and we're looking at Frobenius acting on it. And you can count the numbers of points of x over various extensions as uh, using the trace of Frobenius acting on it. So we don't actually, if we're trying to retain more information, what we actually need to take is the L-adic cohomology and uh, Frobenius acting on it. And so this is going to live in k0 of L-adic endomorphisms. And what I mean here is that instead of here, your objects are sort of q vector spaces. Here, your objects are ql vector spaces plus an endomorphism. And that's going to be your cohomology and Frobenius acting on it. 
So now I'm going to point at these boards, and usually I would have switched vertically, but I wanted this side by side. I wanted to point you that, okay, so now we have homomorphisms from K0 to K0 in all of these cases. And, you know, I'm a topologist, so I look at it and I go, hmm, does that zero really need to be there? Like, couldn't I make this pi zero of something? And then, like, we'd have way more information. Um, and obviously, this will be trivial, and then, like, life will be good. And you can say, okay, so in order to get from K0 to be able to give an entire space or spectrum of K theory, you want to have a way of constructing that. And so these two, is the red visible from the back? Yes, okay. Um, so the, the, these are exact categories. So they have a higher K theory. Um, and one of the first things I want to start with arguing is that finite sets and varieties are also exact categories. I'm going to put exact in quotation marks so that at least I'm not writing anything false. But I, like, the first part of my talk is really going to be arguing that these are exact categories. We're just sort of thinking about exact categories a little bit wrong if we don't notice that. So what, what do I mean by this? I'm going to give a short introduction to exact categories. And this is sort of the wrong audience, or at least half of it is, to give a short introduction to exact categories. But hopefully I'll do this in a way that you haven't seen before. So what is an exact category? Well, it has some objects as a category ought. And then it has two flavors of morphisms, which are usually called admissible monics and admissible epics. Now, when we first start teaching people category theory, we start, one of the things that we really talk about is how it doesn't matter which way arrows point. A category, a morphism in a category isn't a function. It's not defined by set. It is just an arrow. It is a way of getting from A to B. It shouldn't matter which way your arrows point. If all, you know, if somehow you had a mirror on your glasses that reversed every single arrow, nothing should ever change. That's sort of one of the morals. So one of the things I want to emphasize is this is the way we should be writing monics and epics. And one of the things that this kind of notation means is that we shouldn't be composing monics and epics. They point in different directions. So we have this data, and we also have the data of squares. And these are special squares. I'm going to draw them this way. And I'm going to mark them with a square. And what these squares mean is that this composition around the top is the same as this composition around the bottom. That is what these squares mean. They are formal data that tells us how to com com compose mixed kinds of morphisms. Now, monics compose with monics and give you monics. Epics compose with epics and give you epics. And that's all good. But monics and epics on their face should not compose because they point in different directions. So we have to have some data about how these interact inside the category. And these are given by these important squares. And now we can define, so I'm going to, if I call the exact category E, we can define a category QE with objects the same as the objects of E. And morphisms are formal compositions. of an admissible epic and an admissible monic. And these have to be up to isomorphism. I'm sort of sweeping under the rug that there's some isomorphism data that are both of these, and there's a way of encoding that. But you can sort of see how you can sort of sweep that part under the rug. I'm not going to worry about the isomorphisms. Um, and so these are sort of up to isomorphism if you have two different 
formal compositions that are related by an isomorphism in the sense that the left composes when you think of the isomorphism as an epic and the right composes when you think of the isomorphism as a monic, then they're the same. And composition is done via the squares. Right? We write two of these next to each other, and in the middle, we have one of these bottom compositions. And one of the axioms of how an exact category works is that for any thing like this around the bottom, there exists a way of constructing a thing around the top. And uh, then you just compose down the left and compose down the right to get one of these back. So you have this, and we can define the k-theory of E to be loops on B of QE. So this is a short introduction to exact categories and how they work and how you define their k-theories. And let me give you some examples. So the first example is an abelian category. And here, the admissible monics are monics. The admissible epics are epics going backwards. And the squares are uh, pullbacks. Although they're actually both. They both have, every square like that has to be both a pullback and a push out. Um, so here's an example. Hopefully this is a well-known example. But now that we've separated these out, there's no reason why I couldn't have a morphism going this way in my category represent one of these epics. So another example is finite sets, where the admissible monics are injections. The Admissible epics are also injections. And the squares, I'm going to call things like this that are both pullbacks and push out stable squares, just because I'm going to be talking about these a lot. And these are stable squares. So now, when we do this kind of formal composition, both of these morphisms are going in the same direction. But there are two different kinds of morphisms. It's not just that there's a morphism is an injection. A morphism is sort of a sequence of two stages. It's a choice of a, so a morphism from A to B. A has to be a subset of B. But you've also chosen an intermediate set C that you are saying you are mapping through. In, in injections are going that way. The other way. Like, they're all going in the same direction now. Um, but you can't compose them, right? They're different types of injections. There's the monic injections, and there's the epic injections, and they're different. And you can see that because let's look at what, let's see what squares look like when we're trying to compose them. So, so let's say we have uh, set A. So these are all infinite sets. Um, and we have it injects into a set B, and then it injects, which injects into a set C. How do we compose these? So I'm actually going to replace these arrows, because otherwise people will start getting confused. I'm going to start drawing them like this to try to emphasize that they're a different kind of injection, but to, to recall that they're still going forward. So that because you, know, you can have surjections of finite sets. I don't want people getting confused. That um, So I'm going to write this like that. So what do we put here? 
Well, we need the complement of A in here to be the same as the complement of B when it's mapped into C. So what does this mean? This is going to be, need to be A union the complement of B and C. So this is a square that's both a push out and a pull back. And it's, it gives you the correct kind of composition. Where, where does the A go? Where is in the top? In the top, A is going into A. No, but going down to C. Where does A go into C? Um, a goes into C the same way it goes oh, here. Just by doing that. Just by doing that. This tells you where A goes, so you just do it there. And do it there, and it works. And so, OK, so now we can think of the category of finite sets as an exact category. And I'm actually, I'm going to, so definition, this is sort of a definition. When I say exact, we actually have a, a proper term for this. These are CGW categories. And this is joint work with uh, Jonathan Campbell. Um, and what? Close enough for government work? We wanted. <laughs> it's a generalization of exact categories, right? Approximate? Um, anyway, CGW categories. Um, so, um, so you can do this. And you can check that the K theory gives you is actually the correct K theory. It's just going to be the QS0 the way it ought to be. And you can define it as a spectrum using a kind of as dot construction. This, if you want to see more on this, this is, uh, well, I'll mention it later also, but uh, Jonathan has this notion of an SW category, a semi volthausen category, which behaves, which SW categories are to CGW categories as Waldhausen categories are to exact categories. So there's an S dot construction playing around here that you can work with. And so this, this gives you the correct K theory. So what's the statement? K theory in this thing is? Is, so yeah, OK, I will write it down. Mm. Oh, no, I still have some base over there. Excellent. So the K theory taken as a CGW category of uh, finite sets is, well, if you do it correctly, it's a sphere spectrum. And you can also directly compare it. You can directly compare it to the K theory as a Waldhausen category of finite pointed sets. And I just want to comment quickly about this. When you, do, when you want finite sets to be a Waldhausen category so that you can define its K-theory, you put on this disjoint base point so that you have cofiber maps. And your cofiber maps are always collapse a subset to the base point and then map everything else injectively. And these are just the inclusions of a set going the opposite direction. So this, this thinking of fi adding this base point to finite sets and thinking about it as a Waldhausen category was already trying to tell you that your maps are going in the wrong direction. Like at least half of them are. You shouldn't be thinking about them as cofiber maps. You should be thinking of them as inclusions of complements going the other way. And this sort of pulls that out to be at the forefront. But Yeah, I define it as a space. So if you define, if you use the s-dot construction, you can make it a spectrum. But yeah, it's really as zero, a Q as zero. Um, so, so I mean, so, so it's the correct K theory. This gives you the correct construction. And now you can start saying, OK, well, can we do this for varieties? One thing to notice is that if all of those were varieties, it still kind of makes sense if we make the admissible monics closed embeddings and the admissible epics open embeddings, again, going the same direction as finite sets. So that formula up there, as long as you take the union as subvarieties of C, it actually makes sense as a variety.
So last example is that the, uh, we can define varieties as tav, um, well, objects are varieties, and the admissible monics are closed embeddings, and the admissible epics are open embeddings, again, going that way, and the squares are, I'm gonna put stable in quotation marks, I mean, what you want is if we have you want a square like this to be distinguished if sort of D union B is C, so the union of these covers C, and D intersect B is A. Like, this is, this is what you want. And then if you define this this way, it's an exact category. And you can, you know, the composition rule is exactly the same as that one up there. And now we have a K-theory. And so now we have K-theory of varieties is loops on B on Q of varieties. And again, if you want this to be a spectrum, you can use, define it using an SDOC construction if you want. And you just have to have all of your cofiber maps going the wrong direction. And then it works. So, okay. So now we have all of these motivic measures, and they go from K0 to K0. And really, they should just be maps on K theory. So we should possibly be able to get them as maps on between exact categories. So I'm gonna sort of do them in order and build up in complication as I go. And the one thing we have not yet figured out in this story is we have not been able to get it to go into mixed Hodge structures. Um, that is sort of for future work, but I'm gonna be mapping into the K-theory of Q when I do the Euler characteristic. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, yeah, it can be over an arbitrary base, it's just, um, it's easier to tell when it's one story, but yeah, you can do this over an arbitrary base, I think. Um, okay, so let's do this. So first example, so K is finite, and we want the motivic measure that takes X to its K points. And if you look at this definition, well, let's try to extend this to an exact functor from varieties to finite sets. And you just check that it works. Uh, closed embedding gives you an injection, and open embedding gives you an injection. Uh, looking at this diagram that I've been pointing at twice for both varieties and finite sets shows you that squares map to squares. So all the structure works. And so we just get a map on K-theory. So using this, we can actually already get a sort of, well, an interesting thing. So corollary, um, so all of the, oh, I just want to say before I start actually saying like proper theorems, this is all joint with Jonathan Campbell and Jesse Wolfson. Pretty much every single result I'm going to tell you past this point is joint with both of them, so I will say this at this point. So the corollary is that the K-theory of varieties has a sphere that splits off of it. Where, you know, this is just gonna be defined as whatever you get once you split off the sphere. And the reason for this is that we have uh, a map from finite sets to varieties, which takes a set S and maps it to S points. And 
we have a map back to finite sets, which takes a variety x and maps it to its k points. And the composition is the identity. And so once you go to, what? This is just for k finite. Yes, this is for k finite. Um, k finite. Um, yeah, otherwise this doesn't work. It's just not going to work. Um, so, so we get, so you take k theory of all of this. I mean, you might want to check that this is a valid exact functor, but it is. And so we get this. So on one hand, this tells us that for at least for k finite, the k theory of varieties has infinitely many non-zero homotopy groups. So at least it's not an eilenberg maclean spectrum, which is a start. But this might still be an eilenberg maclean spectrum. Like, we don't know that there's more interesting stuff in there. So that's, that's still a place to look. And the other place I want to put is that as, you know, this is for k finite. For k equals, you know, let's say c, which is a definitely an interesting example, we still don't know that this is true. Because this, you know, this forwards map works for any field k, but this second map doesn't. It's, you know, you need something more complicated there. So let's look at Euler characteristic. So I said the Euler characteristic goes into the k-theory of q, but I'm actually going to want to map into the k-theory of z. And once we're just looking at the cohomology with compact support, there's no reason why I need to take q coefficients. I needed it if I want to take the dimension of the vector space. But there is no reason why I can't just say, OK, let's map into the k-theory of z. So we really want a map that sends x to the cohomology with compact supports. Of, so now, now we're looking at the example when k is c. So, but this isn't an exact functor. I mean, if, we're, if we want to do this, we really need this alternating sum. And you don't get an alternating sum by just mapping to a graded group. You need to map to a chain complex. So this doesn't work. So the next thing to try is to try to map it to the chain complex that makes this happen. And this is going to live in chain complexes on Z. Now, this isn't a k category with good K theory, because it's not finite in any way. And K theory is the study of finiteness. And but the nice thing is that these are nice finite dimensional spaces. They have only have finitely many cells. So like when we take, for instance, the singular cohomology here, we need to take, you know, it's going to be huge. And, but if we really want things to be functorial, it's sort of the best cohomology to take. Um, but it turns out that if we just take homologically bounded chain complexes, so each module can be enormous. And there can be infinitely many of them. But once you take the cohomology, it needs to be finite. You can actually prove that this is going to be the same after k theory. So when you, after applying k theory, this is going to be the same as the k theory of z. This is good enough. This is sort of the biggest version of gillet waldhausen we could get. Everything can be infinite except for the cohomology. And it still works. So, uh, so you can do this. And in order for this to work properly, like we need to add a disjoint base point to, act, to the complex points of x to take its cohomology. But that's fine, because once we've taken the complex points, we have a topological space. And so we're fine. Like we, we can just add a disjoint base point, and that's a functorial compactification. Uh, not a, just a, a base point at infinity to com the one point compactification, and it works. Like this, this is a nice functor. And now the only problem is that this is not exact. One point compactification is a compactification. So, yeah, sorry, I, and then I corrected me. I didn't. I did not mean that. I wrote plus, but I mean one point compactification. Well, you mean that. Yeah, sorry. I, I meant one point compactification.
So, yeah, sorry, I misspoke. Um, so this is at least a functor, which is a good start, but it's not exact. And the reason it's not exact, if you start playing around with, so let's see what happens just on the structure of the exact category. If we have a closed embedding, it's contravariant. If we have an open embedding, it's covariant. And that's actually totally fine, because we want squares of the form for varieties to turn into squares of the form for an abelian category. Like, we want our squares to go from these weird pushing two maps going in one direction up squares to pullback squares. So we want one of the signs to reverse direction. And that's exactly what cohomology with compact supports does. However, we have the problem that if, if you think about singular cohomology, you have this problem that it is not the case that any simplex is either in a set or in the complement. Like you can have simplices that sort of stretch across the two. So we still get a long exact sequence in cohomology, but it's not an exact functor. But luckily when we look at chain complexes, we also have weak equivalences, and this functor is weakly exact, meaning that exact sequences map to things that are weakly equivalent to exact sequences, and squares map to things that are weakly stable squares, like weak equivalent to stable squares. And this is good enough. Uh, this is uh, the only place I could find this. If, you, if anybody knows another reference, I'm happy to use it. But the only place I could find this was in one of the gazillions of papers of Bloomberg and Mandel, that having a weakly exact functor is good enough to give you a map on K-theory. But it's good enough. Excellent. So we have a map on K-theory which goes take my cheat sheet here or else I'll mess up the diagram. Um, so now we have a map on K-theory, which goes from the K-theory of varieties, or C, to the K-theory of Z. Um, and I'm going to write down how that goes. So we have varieties, and we have finite sets. And we have a map like this, but I'm actually going to draw this map in yellow. Eh, I doubt yellow will be visible. I'm going to draw it in red to make it clear that I'm not actually saying what this map is yet. And this goes to homologically bounded chain complexes on Z. And this is going to go to finite pointed sets. And then I'm going to have Z modules and Z modules. And again, I want these finitely generated. So there's an inclusion this way, which is, multiple, which is just inclusion as a thing concentrated in degree 0. And we have an inclusion this way, which for any finite set just takes the z to that power. OK. And now I want to, so this, this is the status that we have. And I'm going to claim a corollary of this fact that this exists. Um, so this is the theorem. And the corollary is that k of varieties over c has infinitely many non-zero homotopy groups. So how are we going to prove this? Well, I'm going to let x be a smooth projective variety. And I'm going to let uh, d sub s be the image, the size of the image of j at 4s minus 1. 
And there's a theorem which says that we have pi 4s minus 1 of O going to pi 4s minus 1 of the sphere spectrum going to k 4s minus 1 of z. And this is injective with image size equal to ds. So what we're going to do is we're going to use this to find uh, something in k 4s minus 1 of varieties that is non-zero. So we're going to factor this map through uh, uh, through the, well, we're going to factor this map through uh, this map here. So, and I want the thing that I want about this is that I want the Euler characteristic of x to be relatively prime to ds, and you can always find such a variety. Okay, so what are we going to do? We're going to make this pink map be the thing that includes, that takes s and it maps it to the disjoint union over s of x. So now instead of taking a point for each point in s, we're just taking a copy of x. And now over here, I'm going to take multiplication by the Euler characteristic of x. And I'm going to take a map here which is going to take any z module and is going to tensor it with the cohomology of x, where, because of space limitations, I mean the complex points of x here. So, and the point of these dotted arrows is that this is where CGW categories turn into Waldhausen categories. So everything on the right here is a Waldhausen category. Everything on the left here is a CGW category, and these are sort of the functors that map between them. And now the point is that this diagram commutes once you apply K theory. I mean, what does multiply by chi of x? Uh, well, chi of x is uh, an integer. It's the Euler characteristic of x. So if you have a z module, you can take the map that takes every element and adds it to itself that many times. Um, and on K, sorry, on K theory. Sorry, this is on K theory. Thank you. Yes, this is, there's not this, thank you, there's not this map on z-module. This is on k-theory. So I'm too used to applying k-theory to every diagram I see. On k-theory, this is multiplication, and then that works. Yeah, this is not an exact functor otherwise. Thank you. Okay, so now after applying k-theory, this diagram commutes. And then what happens is, well, if you map across the bottom, we get this right-hand map here, which we know has this image, has this correct image of size for us of ds. And then we're multiplying by something relatively prime to that. So this map is going to have a non-zero image. But we can factor this map through this map here. So since it has non-zero image on the right, it must have factored through something non-zero on the left. And therefore, that element was non-zero. So now we know that the k-theory of varieties over C has infinitely many non-zero homotopy groups using a motivic measure. Ah, oh, good. And I have just enough time to tell you the last, to talk about the last part, which I have already erased. Excellent. That's the Euler characteristic. And we'd really like to be able to lift this to the k-theory of mixed Hodge structures. But so far, we've been having technical issues due to a similar technical issue to the one I'm going to discuss right now. Uh, J is a map. Uh, it's the. It's that map. Yeah. Um, um, not in a couple of minutes, but there's many people in the audiences who, in the audience who are experts who can. 
So um, I'm just going to refer you to the audience. But if you look up J, it's a well, you can just look it up. It's um, Adam's J homomorphism. And uh, there's a lot written on it. And if you're looking at pi 3, uh -huh. the of J is order 24, and the k period Z is order 48. Um, so do you have any idea what, what, what the sign is of the k period? Is the k period right? No, we don't. Um, we'd like to. Like one of the things that we'd really like, one of the reasons we'd really like to be able to power up this map is to be able to detect more things in the K-theory of varieties. But right now, the only thing we can do with this is say, hey, it's non-zero. Um, so yeah, we'd love to know more about it. But at the moment, we can't say anything. So no, morally speaking, it should be enormous. But right now, so far, what we've said is it's at least size 24. Um, so some of this, on one hand, this is a very weak thing to say. But on the other hand, so far, we, we can say it. We're pretty happy that we can say it. Um, a couple of years ago, we couldn't. Um, so OK, so we have this. So now let's look at the example back when k is finite of the zeta function. So if you recall, I said that the, the local zeta function goes from k0 of varieties to the k0 of endomorphisms. And this is, on one hand, this is true. It does. But on the other hand, it actually factors through the k0 of automorphisms. Because Frobenius is an automorphism, not, an endo, not just an endomorphism. So, uh, so we can do it this way. So what we're actually going to be lifting is this map here. It turned out that this map is much easier to lift than this composition. Um, I mean, obviously, you can then compose down. But it turned out that just formally, this was much easier. So we now have the following problem. When I was doing this functor here, I said, take the one-point compactification, and this is a nice functorial compactification. When we're working with l homology, we no longer have a nice functorial choice of compactification. We have a whole bunch of different ones that we can choose. And you know, we, there's no good way of choosing it. So in order to do this, we need to, as in the standard category theoretic technique, not make one choice, make all choices. So we can define a category var compact where the objects are inclusions, dense open inclusions from a variety into a compactification. And your morphisms are compatible with compactification. And by this, I mean a closed embedding is one that's a closed embedding on the variety coordinate and a, that extends to a closed embedding on the compactification. Uh, an open embedding is an open embedding on this coordinate that extends to a closed embedding on the compactifications. And now we can have, we have the following diagram. We have the category of varieties. We have the category of varieties of compactification. And we have a forgetful functor here. And now that we have this choice, we can actually define a functor to, again, homologically bounded chain complexes. And what we're going to do is we're going to take continuous representations of the Galois group of K. Now. Again, we can't t if we want this to be functorial, which we do, then we can't take uh, bounded chain complexes. We have to take these big ones, which are only homologically bounded and can be infinite in every degree. But we can actually do that. And then again, we have this map concentrated at degree 0 of continuous representations. And OK, so this map, after applying K-theory, this 
is an equivalence. And this functor, and this is sort of amazing, this functor becomes exact. This functor is exact. It's not weakly exact, it is exact. And uh, that is because you can take for your nice resolution of your sheaf, you can take the Godemont resolution, which only depends on the stocks. And the nice thing about every point is that it is either in your subvariety or in your complement. So you don't end up with any of this weird having to worry about weakly exact stuff because you have, uh, because you're actually looking at points, not simplices or anything bigger than a point. So this functor actually turns out to be exact, which is pretty awesome. However, we end up with this problem that, you know, we just added a whole bunch of things here, and we want them all to be equivalent. And now, CGW categories didn't have anything built in for talking about weak equivalences. Like, we really want to be able to say, okay, well, if you have two choices of compactification and a map that's the identity over here and just changes the compactifications, then that's a weak equivalence. So, but I said earlier that there's this technology called SW categories, and CGW categories to SW categories is exactly the same, like, literally, you can write down the same proofs as exact categories are to Waldhausen categories. So we can add in weak equivalences the same way you can you add in weak equivalences here when going from an exact category to uh, to, uh, to a ch uh, an exact category with weak equivalences. You can go from a CGW category to a CGW category with weak equivalences, and then this becomes an equivalence on K theory. And so now we actually get a map from varieties to these continuous representations. And now we can say, okay, we'll specialize to Frobenius, and that gives us an automorphism of QL. And that's a perfectly, now we can map down to here. Or we can map all the way down to here and forget that it's an automorphism and just treat it as an endomorphism. So really now, once you're over here, you can map down to these however you like. So again, this is the theorem that this works. Good, and I did not erase the diagram. Yes, the theorem is that this that this works and exists, and all the red stuff is true, and we get an, a, a map on K theory spectra. Ah, excellent, and this is right below that. Where did I put my chalk? Where? Yes. 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 Um, the reason I didn't is about to appear right here. Um, so, uh, okay. So now, back when we were just doing point counting, we had this corollary that when k is finite, we have infinitely many non-zero homotopy groups, but we couldn't say anything about this k tilde. So now the corollary of this theorem here is that pi 1 of k tilde is non-trivial. So we can construct non-zero elements here. And we honestly think that this technique should actually give us lots of ways of constructing non-zero elements elsewhere. We're just having a little bit of trouble with the computations. But hopefully, later, I'll be able to tell you, oh, no, this has infinitely many non-zero homotopy groups. But how are we going to prove this? Well, if you look at this diagram here, at least not the stuff on the right, but on the left-hand side, if we add in this var compact over there, we can still do a similar thing. We can take a variety x. If we make it smooth projective, then we can choose its compactification to be itself. So we can make this map from finite sets go to var compact by, instead of taking disjoint union copies of x, we can take copies of x with itself and the identity map as the compactification. And then 
upstairs, you can do um, you can do this map here. So the way that we're going to do this is we're going to construct a map from K1 of varieties, it's going to be called H2, to Z mod 2, which is 0 on uh, pi 1 of S, this S right there that we pinch off, and we're going to find it and we're going to find an alpha in K1 of varieties with H2 of alpha not equal to 0. And for this particular example, I'm going to assume that the size of K is congruent to 3 mod 4, but this can be modified by doing something just slightly more complicated. But I'm almost out of time, so I don't want to worry about that. So what are we going to do? We're going to find a place on the board. Ah, I know. There's a board. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take, okay, we have K1 of automorphisms of QL. And this is, you know, this lift of the zeta function maps to that. And then Milner constructed a map from K1 of automorphisms of the field to K2 of the field. And then we can take the, the, we can specialize to L equals 2 and take the L attic Hilbert symbol and that will map to Z mod 2. And what this does is, what is an element of K1? Well, it's a module and two commuting automorphisms. So what this Milner map does is it sort of says, oh, look, you have a module and two commuting automorphisms. That's an element in K2. And morally speaking, what I'm about to say is a total lie. You take the determinants of the two automorphisms and you put them together into a, to make the symbol which is representing the element in K2. So what is the element, in, the non-trivial element in pi 1 of s is represented by two points being swapped. That's the variety is two points, and the automorphism is the swap. And then the other one is Frobenius. And so when you take it to the two uh, determinants, you get a 1 from Frobenius and a negative 1 from the swap. And because the Hilbert symbol checks whether one of them is a square, one is a square. And so this maps to 1. And now if you take, if in, so this is x's disjoint union copies two points. On the other hand, if you take p1 disjoint union p1, then the swap still gets mapped to negative 1, but Frobenius gets mapped to q. And then if q is 3 mod 4, q is not a square and negative 1 is not a square, so this gets mapped to negative 1. And so these are not the same. And thus, we have a non-zero element in K1 of varieties, in the reduced K1 of varieties. Um, Q is the number of elements in K. What? Q is, number Q is the number of elements in K. Yes, thank you. Sorry, I didn't write that, but yes. Um, and I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop at this, although the one last remark I want to make is that we specialized so much to get this, and we took such simple examples. There's going to be a lot more of them. But this is a nice, simple computation that you, you can extend this quite far. But even on this very simple level, you can get that there's non-trivial elements in there. And that's what I wanted to say.